<laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> well, we're two or three are gathered, and God is with us. Is that right? We were just talking about that, uh, Dan and I, and so forth. But we figure a quorum is two to three. Thank you very much for that input, and that's uh, biblically and scripturally correct, right? So, all right, well, we're going to start anyway, and as people come, they'll come. Um, this is Resurrection Weekend. And uh, how many of you, you've always been an Adventist, right? No, I'm talking to the guy, Robert, you've been, right? How about you, John? Have you been an Adventist all your life? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, I know your story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, we, uh, as you know, my story, because I told him to many of Robert could probably get up here and correct the errors that I make. That's really bad when somebody's correcting your story, you know. But I can remember as a member of the Evangelical United Brethren Church, Easter weekend was one of the biggest weekends in the church. Friday night we had a program and a prayer session uh, and so forth, because that was, you know, um, <clears throat> Good Friday and so forth, and then Saturday, we had a program, but Sunday, we would be there at six in the morning, and we used to call it the sunrise service, but despite the pagan implications on that, the people, the believers, weren't concerned about the uh, pagan, but they would believe so. this was a way that they wanted to celebrate the resurrection. So we'd have breakfast in the morning, and big breakfast, and so forth, and then we would have a Sunday school, and then we'd have church service, and then we would have a huge meal afterward, and so forth. And I can remember my mother, when we go to church, the Easter dress was critical. Got, you know, they got the Easter dress, okay, and so forth. Went down to the store and bought it, or the latest they had, and so forth. But it was... <laughs> well, applicable only to the women. The guys wore the same old stuff. You know, the tie, the shirt, and nobody cared. Uh, and so forth. But you know what I'm reminding of that uh, Pastor and I would just talk about it out there. The old, the old slogan was that if you never came to church, you always came to Easter service, right? And you always came on Christmas. And I got to thinking, if you only came to church twice a year, at least the sermon you're going to get on Easter is one of the greatest events that happened in Earth's history, is it not? If it wasn't for the resurrection, we might as well all go home. Isn't that right? So if you're going to hear a message, you should hear it on the, uh, you, sh you should hear about the resurrection. That's, that's all there is to it. Um, anyway, so we're going to talk about that today. We've got a lot of activities. We're going to just kind of run through this because we have a lot to discuss today. Let's see if we can actually get through this one of these times and so forth. So anyway, um, let's take a look at a couple of things. Today we're going to be discussing the situation of what really happened, and I think as Seventh-day Adventists, I think most of us have some form of an answer about what happened, where we came from, who we are, why are we in this mess today, and where are we going, right? We can all answer that. I think we have a lot of pat answers for that and so forth. And so, we're going to do a little introduction, and it says this. This is in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 16 through 20. For if the dead were not raised, then Christ had not been raised either. Now, you know, in the church of Corinth, there was an argument back in those days about whether Jesus was resurrected or not. Paul makes a very powerful statement here in the book of Corinthians. And let's take a look at it together. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is what? Futile. Let's go home. It's over. It's done. All right? And so he goes on to say, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. And Paul was being easy on us when he said that. All right? But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Do you think that we should be happy today that our Christian brothers and sisters, who are not all Seventh-day Adventists, today are worshiping the same Jesus and are thankful for his death, his life, and the resurrection? Because Jesus had the famous words, it is finished. The conclusion of the matter took place at the cross and Jesus' resurrection, right? Pardon? For the first time of creation, it is finished. 
That's right. Good point. Very good. And you know what? I'm glad you brought that up. You kind of jumped ahead, but we may have to do that. We'll never get through uh, and so forth. So did you hear that comment? Is creation. Okay, well, in order for the Savior to save us, he had to do something to us. He had to recreate. Isn't that right? If so if he couldn't have created to begin with, we could not be born again. Isn't that right? So good point. And that's where we're going today, to be very frank with you. Okay. So what happens? This is Sunday's lesson. This is a question that I did not take from my lesson, but uh, it's close. And I was looking at the, on the web uh, of Dr. Rutland. I don't know if you know him. He's from the National Institute of Christian Leadership. He does a lot of programs over the web as well as in person on Christian leadership and pretty well known in the Christian community. And so they did a survey to question of un unbelievers, people who have no relationship with Jesus and confess as such. And there were two basic questions that were one and two, and here's what they are. The number one question everyone has is, if God is so good, so strong, and so caring, why is there so much suffering in this world, and is God real? How would you address that question? And there's a lot of different answers. And the, most of them are pretty good. So how would you address that? If God is good, why is there so much suffering? That's right. Isn't that a fair question? So, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I mean, really, let's think about that. It's a fair question. If God's so good, why do we have such a mess here? Because of the choice. Freedom. Okay. Thank Freedom. You. Okay, because of choice. When, what was that? Choice. Okay, choice. Because God is on trial. God's on trial. The great controversy. The great controversy. Okay. All of those things. Now, I'm an unbeliever. I don't know about the great controversy, right? All I know is, is the world stinks and God made it. <laughs> <laughs> now, seriously, that's what people look at. And, you know, as we are, being a marketing guy, the gospel is a product. And people buy stuff because of the fact they have a need. And when they sense they have a need and that product addresses it, what do they do? They buy it. Didn't Jesus say, come and buy from me? Did he not? Okay, Bob? Well, it's a controversy that God created the world and it's cheap crap. How about the, all the car makers that make beautiful, nice, running, good cars that get us down the road and comfort and style and Yep. And then there's these idiots that come out and get them and run into crowds and kill people with them. It's not the car maker's fault. No? That's no? Chevy's fault. Pardon? That's only Chevy's fault. <laughs> I have no comment on that either. <laughs> All right. So if God's so good, and is God really real? Can we prove in the day of evolution, and it is a day of evolution, I don't think in most of our universities they start off with creation story. In fact, probably in many cases, you'd probably be barred from class if you brought it up. But the point is, is can we really prove creation? Because it looks like in the Bible, God doesn't go to the point of proving. He says it is. Just that, that's just the way it is. And so forth. So let's take a look at the story, uh, these verses if we can. What happened? There we go. Okay, and we want to just put that in our back burner here, faith and trust. Faith is a whole different ballgame. Well, I mean, uh, I mean about creation, for example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, according to Paul, everything. you don't need the Bible to believe that God exists. Uh, um, because you have nature, and nature is God's second. All place. right, and that's our next slide. I want to talk about that because that is a good point. Michael Behe says the same thing. He uses the mousetrap theory. You've heard that? Yep. I have. Yeah. So basically the, the idea is that life is so complex that it could have never evolved because there's things that depend on each other in order to exist and they could not have had one like a mousetrap. You need all four pieces in order for a mousetrap. Absolutely. 
Let's take a look at this, first of all. In John, uh, Genesis 1-1, we see, and if you go through the first three or four verses, we see the whole Godhead involved in Genesis 1-1. It just says God, in the beginning God, because the Trinity is God, isn't that right? But it's three persons, but it is God. Okay, and it says God created the heavens and the earth. That's just what he says. I created the heavens and earth. Then we go down to John 1, verse 1 through 3, which is the genesis of the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. When we're talking about the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So now what do we see in the creation story? We see an active member of the three persons who made everything. And we know his name was Jesus, right? And so forth. And that's good because what you just brought up is the fact that Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection paved the way for us to be recreated. So yeah, there's, there's a time. So it would make, sh when we think, why did Jesus come? Why didn't the Father come? Because Jesus is the creator of everything, right? Paul, yeah. was, Paul when he was talking to a, uh, people that did not know who God was at Athens, that's the first thing that he says is God and who made everything, who made the world and everything in it. Yep. So the first point that he makes is that God is the creator. All right, that's true. Okay, let's get rid of some of this paper I got in here. All right, so let's go, well, let's go back to Psalms 3, um, 100 verse 3. You know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us, and we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Why are we here? Now, specifically, we can talk at creation, because we were created on the sixth day, right, along with the other animals, and so forth. And so why are we here? Because God wanted us here. Isn't that right? And why? Because we are his people. And uh, of course, you know, at conversion, we're told that when we accept Jesus, we have the right to become children of God. I like that. You have the right to become children of God. That's it's okay. You have the right to claim that and so forth. So let's go on. Now we're going to talk about what Dan was talking about before. Let's take a look at this. I'd like to have your opinion on that and your input on this. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, we're going to talk about that one man theory, and death through the sin, and the way of death came to all people because all sin. Death came to all people because of Adam. Some people say, well, why can't we have because of the sins of Eve? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. If it's fair that because of one sin, all have sinned, it's, isn't it fair that one man die who's righteous so righteous can be spread to everyone? That's fair, isn't it? God is a just God, not just a loving God. That's a just act. What's the difference, though, between the two? And Bob mentioned it earlier. What's the difference between the two? We've talked about it before. We, but we, have, we are born sinners. We don't have a choice in that, but we have a choice whether or not to make those sacrifices. Okay. Did you hear that? We have a choice in the second one. Righteousness is ours to take, and it's a gift, but you have to take it. Is that being unfair? that God had made it slightly different than the sin of Adam. The righteousness of Christ has one condition. You have to take it. How hard is it to take a gift? How difficult is that? But Adam took a choice too. Yeah. That's, well, that's right. That's right. Well, in a way, Adam's sin was a choice, yes. But for you and I... For us, it's not. But for that's Adam, right. For it's Adam, it was. But for us... You were born that way. And so God says, you know, it's only just. Jesus came not just because he loved us. He came because it was the right thing to do. Isn't that true? If God is just and sin has spread to all men by the actions of one man, which you had nothing to say about, would it be unjust for God not to come? 
And the answer is yes. Jesus came because it was the right thing to do, but because he's God, he didn't have to do the right thing. Most of the gods we see uh, that the Israelites were worshiping weren't concerned about whether it was right or fair, but God was. Yeah, Bob. Well, if, if he hadn't come and done that, died and saved us, the devil could have pointed out and say, hey, good point. the whole universe would have been in chaos. Can you imagine? That's what I would say if I'd been an angel. Wait a minute. Hold on. That isn't fair to these people. Okay. He would have had a case. Would he not have? Yes. But we never want to forget, because God so loved the world that he came. It was his love, as well as the right thing to do, that brought about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's go on. But your iniquities have separated you from God, so that you will not hear. Now, and this is a, a thing, uh, we're, we're kind of looking at Adam and Eve as we're talking about the creation story. And when they sinned, we say that sin separates us from God, but who really does the separating? We do. And we know that because Jesus comes to see them. He knows what's transpired. And he always asks, where are you? Where are you? And where are they are? It's hiding in some bushes somewhere, right? And so forth. They separated themselves. Let me ask you a question. As we look at the sin of Adam and Eve and the fact they couldn't face God, they separated from him. God would have been happier if, when he came and said, we messed up, we blew it. But the relationship changed because of their sin, right? And so forth. So have you ever been to a situation where you have done something you shouldn't have done, whatever, and you didn't go pray because you felt you weren't in a position to pray? Have you ever been in that position? Well, because of something you did, something you might have said, run it over, and you, you normally have your evening prayer and whatever, your own closet prayer, and you say, uh, uh, I'll pass on that right now. I'm not in that spiritual. Have you ever been there? That's the little Adam and Eve in us, okay? The same situation is it just seems to be natural that when we fall short of God, our instinct is just walk away from him. What about the disciples? Did they do that? Can you think of a time when they knew they were doing something wrong, but they stayed away from Jesus? Do you remember anything about that? What about when they were talking about who's the greatest? That is, it's almost humorous. But then they think about it, it's not so humorous, because it applies to, we can see us in that. They're arguing about it. What does the Bible say? They were a far distance off, so Jesus couldn't hear them. Yeah, and that was kind of public. <laughs> he walks in and puts on a towel and starts washing their feet. Yeah. Yeah, sin separates. We are not comfortable with God when we have sin in our life. And so God has an answer for that. First of all, number one is he needs to make us clean before we can grow as Christians. That's why salvation comes first, right? He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us the gift of repentance. He gives us a heart that has no condemnation, and he gives us peace. You have to have that before you can start doing anything in your Christian life. You have to know that you're part of the family of God. You need to know that. You're not bragging because Jesus did that for you. Now I can go out and tell people about Jesus, right? I need to know what he promised is true, right? And that's what Easter is all about. It's a reminder that Jesus came so you could spend eternity with him, that you could have the ad assurance, and then he wants us to grow, to learn to be obedient, but at the same time knowing, just like a child in a family, you might slip, you might fall, you might look the other direction sometimes, you might willingly do something, but you're still in the family. And then Jesus said, because you are in the family, I want you to come to me. He never turns people away when they come to him and say, you know, I've blown it. You just be very honest with him and say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I need your strength and your power to give me the desire and the power to live the life you want me to live. And you thank him for his salvation, and you thank him that he is there for you. Okay, enough of that. 
So let's go to the next part here. Well, since the creation of the world, the Bible says, because of the creation that we observe, Dan made reference to this, people have no excuse. Somebody want to get into that? What is God telling us here? We, oh, well, then we don't really need to study the Bible. All we need to do is look at, you know, just look outside. In fact, we were on a cruise many years ago. And um, how many have been on cruises? Uh, got a feeling it's a, an age issue. <laughs> it's, you have to be 60 or older to be on a cruise. That, that, you, were you that old when you went on a when you cruise? No? I think so. Oh. <laughs> Kill and I were on, uh, you know, we had two cruises. We loved them both and have been on one since. So whatever that means. But we were out walking on the deck. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning. We're out in the middle of the ocean. We're going to, we're going to the Southern Caribbean. And I've never seen so many stars in my life. It was awesome. It was magnificent. You could see some meteors even falling and so forth. And God is saying, you see, how can you look at all of this and say that I don't exist? And he says, you're not, without excuse. If you just had that. Doesn't mean we have a full knowledge of God. There are other ways and so forth that we can get a closer relationship with him. But this is one parameter. Yes? Uh, we, we were studying uh, Daniel 5, 6. And um, it, it's interesting that, that ne uh, Belshazzar grabs the cup from the, the temple of Jerusalem and drinks out of it. it because that's a design. It, it, in other words, he knew better. Otherwise, he wouldn't be attacking that God. We see it in society today. People might say God doesn't exist. But you never hear somebody say, excuse me, but Buddha, damn it. You never say some, hear somebody say, Harry Krishna, you know? It's always... Yeah, it, that's Lord a good point. Yeah. Now, if, if you don't believe, then why wouldn't it be random? But people do have enough evidence that even though it's subconscious, they know that there's a God. Yeah, there, I believe, and I think I can say this, just if you disagree with this statement, uh, which can happen... <laughs> is that there are very few atheists in this world. Maybe plenty of agnostics, but very few atheists. Have you ever met an atheist? Ever. One that said, there is no God, period. Or have you more like heard? Yes, I know there's a power there. There's something there. There is some form of recognition that there is a God. Because they look at everything and say, this just this couldn't happen. Things don't just happen. Even in evolution, from a one-cell animal to a multiple cell. Okay, and so where did the beginning start? Evolution does not address that question. Where does it start? It can't answer that question. The Bible does. The Bible does. It gives a, a reasonable explanation, even if you're a non-believer, that there is a God. Remember, faith is... You say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Getting back to your point, uh, Bob. But we must believe that he exists. That's what this is talking about. And that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. That's the last part. Seeking him. And as long as we can seek him, we are in good shape. Okay. All right. Created in the image of God. What a statement. What in the world does that mean? Uh, I mean, really? Uh, and so forth. And you get all kinds of answers. So I'm going to ask you, how would you explain to someone, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? I'd like to know what you think. And I want to read it just out of some commentary. What do you think? Because what we think has a lot to do with what we think of God and so forth and how he works in us. So anything that comes to your mind, if, and, and probably the first thing that comes to mind, I say, I mean, they say, you know, you were created in the image of God. What does that mean? Anybody want to give it a try? Look, it's got to mean in look and form because it says in the likeness. <laughs> okay. So Bob's saying, I wish we had an easel board up here. Physically. Okay. He looks... When we look alike, like him. Okay, well, now Jesus, when he was here, he looked kind of like us, right? In fact, very much like us, right? Okay, so let's, let's take that point. Okay. I am not created in the image of God. We 
are created in the image ah, of God. Ah, so here we go. He just threw a spike into the, the rail. The, the first word for God in Genesis is Elohim, which is plural. And it is correctly translated, let us make man in our image. So man and woman was created in the image of God. The union of husband and wife was a reflection of okay. God. Okay. He's always ahead, but that's okay. <laughs> no. When I do this, they always have to replace the mic since I'm standing on it more than I'm having it on my uh, shirt. So anyway, it's either that or the other thing that keeps falling off. So, you know, you can't win. We'll see how long that lasts. All right. You don't think it's going to make it, John? It's going to fall off? Well, whatever. All right. So let's talk about that for a minute. God creates Adam, right? And uh, does he make a helper or a companion for him immediately? Okay. Now, why would that be? What does he do instead? One thing in particular the Bible says, he goes out and he names all the animals. How long does that take? A couple of weeks? Uh, you know, and so forth. Why do you think God delayed in creating a woman? You have any unhappy husbands here? <laughs> no. Why do you think he would do that? If Adam's looking at the animals. What does he see in these animals? Pairs. And here's Adam, and there's no one like him. I'm going to make a statement. I want you to comment on true or false. Adam would not have been completely ha happy in Eden had God not created a woman. True or false? How many think it's true? Okay. It's kind of like a political year. Nobody wants to raise their hand. <laughs> How many think that's a false statement? I'm sorry, what was that again? I say it was to his fall as well. I mean, Eve sinned first by eating the fruit, and then he went along with his mate. If he hadn't had a mate, maybe it wouldn't have happened. You see, your wife's not here, so that's <laughs> probably good. Uh, well, <laughs> well <laughs> it is true, and we're going to talk about Eve's sin, because the Bible is pretty tough on Adam, and uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Well, but. I uh, yeah, well, I knew you'd say that. <laughs> well, uh, uh, not, not, uh, but it, you, you just mentioned he named all the animals, mm -hmm. right? He did not give her the name Eve until after sin. That's right. Well, he didn't have her then. Because he's saying, I have the authority now to name you. That's a scary thing. I think his fall was worse than hers. Well, we're going to talk about that. Guys, I wouldn't let you jump ahead on that one. No. That is what we're getting to. Okay, and so forth. So I'll have to watch the time because we definitely want to get there. It's important. Okay, and so he sees all of these animals, right? And he's thinking, wait a minute. There was something empty in his life. Is it possible to live with God? And see if I'm taking this out of context because I want you to comment on this. To be with God in perfect Eden and be unhappy because you need someone that's like yourself, but yet different. Is that what it's saying? Didn't God say, what did he say? Is it good or bad that he doesn't have a companion? What did God say? It is not good. Is that what he said? This is not a good thing. That's right. It's a good point. Good point. Your wife will bring that up on Mother's Day. <laughs> right? So anyway, Bob, go ahead, and then I'll finish this. Yeah. Apparently so. And that's why he created Eve for Adam, but he waited until he kind of got the bug that he needed something before he went through with it. Okay. John? Well, uh, if uh, Adam was using uh, Christ as an example, Christ didn't have a wife. Didn't have a mate. So you have to kind of look at that, I think, a little differently. Well, let's talk about that. I think it's, since you brought it up, let's talk about that. Jesus came for a one 
primary purpose. Maybe you could say two. But they all kind of fold together. What did he come for? To save us. Number two is Jesus was God, not us. Uh, as far as I know, the, the Trinity doesn't have a spouse. The Trinity is one in itself as far as relationship and so forth. So when God created us, man and woman, he felt that that's what was needed for their happiness. They needed companionship with something that was like them, but yet different. And in this world today, let me ask you something. The world today is trying to destroy differences between male and female. Do you agree with that statement? Why do you think they would do that? When God says it's not good that man should be alone. Satan is saying, you know, who cares? Male and female are exactly the same. Everything is done the same. Doesn't make any difference. There's no different responsibilities for one or the other. Well, Lucifer was never married. Well, that's probably a good point. <laughs> no, but he probably knew that destroying that kind of a relationship would work. And I know that today, it, you know, living in the world that we do, despite COVID, is that relationships are probably as difficult as they've ever been today and so forth, for probably a, a lot of reasons. But God created Adam and Eve to be very imminent. In fact, when he talks about his church, what does he use as an example? The husband and the bride. That that relationship should be the closest of any relationship other than our relationship with God. You agree with that? So you look at these little things, and you see how our culture is twisting and turning and trying to destroy the very things that God said was good. And we don't think about it because we become accustomed to it. We see it all the time. That's all we see. That's all we hear through the social media and wherever else. We go back to creation and we say, look, God said, I know how to keep you happy. But if you don't follow this, I will tell you that you will suffer. And as husbands and wives, we have responsibilities one to another. Each one brings something that gives us a total image of what God is like. Man's incomplete without woman and vice versa, as Dan made mention to. So, how would you explain it? I'm going to very quickly, let's take a look. This is what's called Bible references. You can find it on the internet. And not everything is great on the internet. Yeah, Bob? Not to my knowledge. That's your trivia question, Pastor. <laughs> I've always wondered that. Yeah, well, it's a good question. I think it's, I don't know anything specific. I think it would just be an element of discussion. So, okay, yeah, I probably so. Be, be very subjective, to say the least, right? Yes. There may be little green men out there. We don't know, but we do know because of the book of Job that there are other worlds. We also know, you know, that all these representatives from the different worlds were, were at the door of heaven along with the devil because the devil could still approach God at the heavenly doors until when? Crucifixion. The crucifixion and when Jesus died, it is finished. The death sentence for Satan was made final. His day is over. And so forth. No wonder he runs around like a roaring lion, seeing who he can devour, right? He knows what's going on. Okay, let's take a look at this. We're going to go these really quickly. Bible references off the internet. You can look it up yourself. That's some good points here. Let's take a look at this. One meaning of being created in the image of God is man's unique capacity for moral and rational awareness. We have a moral recognition, even if we haven't even opened the Bible. People have kind of a general thing that says, oh, no, this is not appropriate. They may do it, but there's something within, because every man has a certain measure of faith. Okay? So stop me if you disagree with this. God made humans to be inherently different from animals. He built us into some of his own qualities. We share with him the experience of personality, of trait, beauty, meaning, will, and reason. You agree? So I wanted to show these to you, because look at all the different things that we could say, oh, yeah, that's true. That's how we're kind of like God. That's what it means to be in his image, right? All right, let's go on. 
These attributes allow us to relate to God in ways other created beings cannot. True? Animals work on instinct. Isn't that true? We work on reason and thought. So let's go on. Another meaning is that humans were meant to stand in the image of God's authority on the earth as we rule, rule over and subdue the rest of creation. God gave man dominion. True? Dominion over what? Creation. Pardon? Creation. Creation. Everything, the Bible says. The fishes of the sea, the land animals, you name it. He gave Adam and Eve dominion. But that means also that we... Uh, borrowed dominion, correct? We, to be good stewards, we need to take care of that which he's given us, correct? But we have dominion. That's another reason why we're created in the image of God. Amazing, okay? Let's take another one. This is from the NIV commentary. It says, more likely the image of God describes our entire self, not just one part of us. We'll never be totally like God because he's our supreme creator, but we have the ability to reflect his character our love, patience, forgiveness, kindness, and faithfulness. All right? And then the next says the same thing. And the Lord God commanded man. Oh, well, actually, I missed that. Well, let's move on. And the Lord God commanded man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you eat from it, you will certainly die. Okay, true and false question. I like those. Because you're either all wrong or all right, I suppose. All right, here we go. By God providing an opportunity for Eve to disobey, he was somewhat responsible for her sin. True or false? How many say true? So that must mean everybody says that's not a true statement. Okay, then explain it then. Why wasn't God responsible? He allowed that to happen. He knew it was going to happen. Right? If I have a nice sports car sitting out, I don't, but if I had a nice sports car sitting out front of my house that sees the ignition, would I be responsible if somebody drives it away? Unless it was in the church parking lot. <laughs> people, people have to be responsible for their own decisions. Okay, it's back to what again? Choice, Choice again. Okay, now we do have a book called Prophets and, uh, excuse me, Patriots and Prophets, and there are other places you can find. What I always do when I look at those books, I go back to the Bible, and I say, all right, does this make sense? The Bible doesn't say a lot, does it? And so we find in Patriots that the blanks are kind of filled in. Then you say, does that make sense within Scripture? It does to me from the standpoint that it says that Satan fell as Lucifer, and the process that he went through. And then, of course, he came to this earth, and he got Eve to sin, and so forth. So all of that transpired, right? And we're told in that book, and I don't see any conflict with Scripture with this, is that in essence what transpired is they got the whole history, both Adam and Eve, of what transpired at the very beginning, how sin came about. They were warned about Satan, okay, and what he could do. Now, we're going to get to Dan's point about why does it say because of the sin of Adam? We'll come back to that. Why does it say because of the sin of Eve? That's an important point, and we want to follow that because it has a lot to do with us and deception in the last day. Okay? So, the answer to that is choice. You agree? God allows choice. But there's another point here, and it actually came from your lesson uh, from H.C. Uh, Lloyd and the Exposition of Genesis. This is a very good point, and it talks about God's mercy, even in testing Adam and Eve. Let's take a look at it. The future of the race centers upon this single prohibition. Man is not to be confused by a multitude of issues. Only one divine ordinance must be kept in mind. By thus limiting the number of injunctions to one, Yahweh gives tokens of his mercy. Besides, to indicate that this one commandment is not grievous, the Lord sets it against the background of a broad permission. You can have every tree of the garden. He just had this one tree sitting in the middle of the garden that sits beside the tree of life, right? That's it. No other prohibition. Just one. Now, I want to remind you, Adam and Eve were different than you and I in what major way? Pardon? 
fight. They did not have a bent to sin. Can you imagine what that would be like? John, I can't imagine that. Can you? No. <laughs> What's it like? You know, when we, uh, when the recreation, you know, when Jesus comes a second time, he says mortality will put on immortality. What that really means is this. Not only everlasting life, it means the bent to sin will be taken away. We won't have, a, you know, a desire to sin. It'll be gone. That doesn't happen when we're converted. That's why God gives us the Holy Spirit, to counteract the effects of your sinful nature. That's what Paul is talking about in Romans 7. The things that I want to do, I do not do. Some people say, well, that was before his conversion. It's written in the present tense. It has nothing to do with his previous uh, uh, nature before conversion and so forth. So let's take a look at this one. And... Uh, this is a comment from the Wednesday lesson. It says, in the end, our relationship with God can be effectively and lasting only if we freely choose to accept his will. In essence, rejecting his will is to claim independence from him. Okay, make sense? It indicates we do not need him. Maybe think about that. We get into the shouldn't do, should do thing and focus on externals. What really is happening is we don't really believe God for what he says lack of faith, right? We don't think that he's got it right there. This is a choice that results in the knowledge of evil, and evil leads to alienation, loneliness, frustration, and death. Okay, I'm going to have a question for you, and this is a good one. The message of Genesis is by David Atkinson. He's a chaplain, I think it's Christie University, in Oxford, England. He writes a lot of commentaries on the Old Testament. And uh, I like uh, David, uh, he has some good messages, and here's what he says. But that is the way it is, that's the way it really is in your life and mine. The fact is that all of us have sectors in the territory of our life which we are quite content to leave to God. But each has a point which we, which we will by no means let God approach. Ouch. I think we have to sometimes in the closet of prayer, we have to do a, we look at ourselves and say, is there something in my life that I don't want God to be touching for other reasons? And we'll get into Adam's sin here and why the difference between the two based upon this. Okay, here's the question. The high priest, this is taken from Hebrews 4.15, the high priest of ours understands our weakness since he had the same temptations as we do. How did Christ have the same temptations? All right. And Jesus had all three of those temptations. Yeah, now, we kind of looked at, no, sometimes, you don't get your comments on this. When we look at him, uh, Jesus, when he went out into the wilderness and Satan tempted him, we look at the actions rather than something else. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Now we think, oh, turning stones into bread would be a sin. No. What was the real issue for Jesus? What was the real temptation? Pardon? Self-indulgence. Well, it could be. Yes, but he was okay. hungry, and you needed to eat, but he resisted that temptation to sin to get something to eat. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. He had to choose between to follow his father or to follow give into that temptation. Okay. His choice was not to rather eat bread or not, or turn stones into bread. There's no sin in that. The issue was of using his own power, which he could do. You and I can't do it. But Jesus' temptation, he knew he could. But it was to follow the Father in everything. He lived off his power like we have to live off of it as well. That's his temptation. That's why his temptation is greater. It wasn't the lust of a woman. It wasn't the lust for food. Personally, he didn't have any of that. What he had was... Is doing things in his own power, which he knew he could do. He said, I can let my life go, or I can lift it up. Well, you're preaching today. Devil comes to him and says, Well, if you're the son, so it was to 
which is true. That's what happened with regard to Eve, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But our big, yes, John, I'm sorry, go ahead. Even along with David, even on when, when Christ went in front of the Sanhedrin, when, he, when you know, it was always, you know, prove it, prove it, prove your God, even on the cross. Sure. Prove it. Yeah, at Nazareth, they wanted a miracle. He wouldn't give them one, right, uh, and so forth. But Jesus' real weakness, and it took me a long time, in fact, Molly Vendon helped me with this one, is that this, Jesus' major temptation, we'll go to the Gethsemane, and he prayed, if it be all possible, let this cup pass from me. In his humanity, he did not want to suffer, and being God, of course, thinking of the separation that would exist between the Father and the Son. There was a lot at stake, not just us, and so forth. If it be possible. But nevertheless, he wanted to follow God and his power and so forth. And that's our problem with choice is the fact here that we have difficulty with is that we try, and this is where the Seventh-day Adventists and probably other denominations as well, we try to be righteous by doing things that will basically earn our justification. So it's easy for us to externally look like Christians. And Jesus said, that's not good enough. That's what the Pharisees were like. Okay, God says, sin is a much bigger thing than how you're defining it. Sin is a nature problem. Sin is a head problem. Sin is, goes way, way above. We fight against principalities and powers in high places, and so forth. We focus on externals. Jesus said, you know what? You look clean on the outside. Inside you, rotten as rotten can be. He said, you need a heart change. You need to be motivated by me. You stay attached to the vine, and I'll take care of the fruit. Is that what he said? He didn't ask you to be fruit people. So we think, well, we've got to be kind, got to be patient. We find out after 10 years it isn't working because we need God to intervene in our life. Do you agree with that? That was a situation with Eve. As pastor said, Satan created doubt. You know, Jesus said the, the worst thing that we will have to face in the last days, is found in Matthew 24 and in 2 Thessalonians, is deception. Deception outside of the church and deception within the church. Jesus said, that is what we have to fear. If it be possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Deception. So this is why the Adam and Eve story is so important, because it's based upon deception, right? All right, so let's go on. Maybe. I want to get to that. I think I know. I think Pastor did that because he said it's time to quit. He just cut me off. <laughs> Can you move the slide for me? Because I have nothing. It froze. Dan's charisma, it's got to be it. Well, while they're looking at that, see if I can see what the next slide will be. Throw that out of here. Okay. All right, very quickly. And this goes with what, I think, John, you made reference to this, and others, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me, Jesus said. And we find that in John, the 15th chapter. Now. When the woman saw, we're not going to go through the story, we won't have time, of what happened at Eve at the tree. But let's read the Bible, and here's what it says. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, okay, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, remember Satan said, look, when you eat of this, your eyes will be open, you know good and evil. That was true. They did get a knowledge of good and evil, okay? So it just says she took some of it, she ate it, she gave some to her husband who was with her. What was the deception? What led to the deception? Now we say doubt, not yes, but what was she looking at this fruit? What was it that attracted her? Would it be the senses that we have, what we see, what we smell, what we touch, what we hear? That it was those factors 
that led to her, you know, basically being deceived. Yes. Well, we, do, we know this. Oh, John, go ahead. Well, and, and, you know, she'd already seen the animals. She, she didn't see the snakes. snakes were even around. And they're not like the rattlesnakes we have today. No. This flew. It was beautiful. Yeah, that was something really different. Yeah. Isn't it easy for us when things are pleasing to the eye, things feel good, things look right, and so forth, you get highly exhilarated, exhilarated when you get into this, and so as she said, and we're deceived. Okay, we see things that aren't really there, right? Go ahead. Well, the, the, the thing is, this, this is what we're going to call the here snake cross. But it's just like the Israelites, when they were led out of, the, of the Egypt, they had all these visible demonstrations of God's love and care, and they went south anyway. Yeah, that's the danger of our culture as well. We are currently surrounded by a culture. We need to be very careful what culture teaches us. Okay, it is, and many times it is counter to the word of God. And even with our own, within our own church circle, sometimes people put regulations on that are trivia and don't mean a thing. And you can read that in Galatians, the second chapter on circumcision. On the other hand, we have the other side of the picture. Okay, well, you know, it's all right. It's okay. God doesn't care. You know, that kind of, it's just a small thing. You know, this type of thing. Yes, you had a question. The church does what? Like, they think to them, like, snakes, it's possible. This is not possible. How many snakes were possible? Yeah. There was something that she knew this was not a snake. This was the devil himself. Well, you would think she would know that and, uh, and so forth. So we're going to go a little further. I'm not going to read all of Romans 12 through 17, but what it says is because of the sin of one man, and it mentions Adam. It doesn't say Eve. It says because of the sins of one man, Adam, condemnation and sin spread to all men. But because of the righteousness of one man, Jesus, righteousness spread to how many? All men, not some, all men. Okay, we know that then by have, having an ability to have that means we need to choose it, accept the gift. Now, why is Adam mentioned as the one who sinned rather than Eve? She was tempted, he chose her. Okay, that's a good summary. We may have to end with that one. Yes. Is that what you're going to say? Two people like mine. Okay, let's very quickly, Paul made a statement that says this. And Adam was not the one deceived, okay? It was Eve, and she became a sinner, okay? Now, you're thinking that Paul's being a little biased, but that's what he says, okay? Now, let's go to the next one. NIV commentary kind of sums up. Paul is not excusing Adam for his part in the fall. On the contrary, in his letter to the Romans, Paul places the primary blame for humanity's sinful nature on who? Adam, is that true? Is the primary blame for sin in this world on Adam or Eve? It's on Adam. What's another reason for it? However, she did leave Adam's side. Pardon? She did leave Adam's side. And if she had stayed with him, he would have never believed that they would be with Adam. By having unity together, they had a better way. When Adam would have said something and so forth. Well, maybe. We'll see. Okay. Deplorable, this is from the SDA Bible commentary, as Eve's transgression, as fraud as it was with potential woe for the human family, her choice did not necessarily involve the race and the penalty for her transgression. It was the deliberate choice of Adam, the full understanding of an express command of God rather than hers that made sin and death the inve inevitable lot of mankind. Eve was deceived, Adam was not. Adam knew what was going on. When she gave him the fruit, he knew that that serpent was Satan. He knew it was not right. Why do you think he said, okay, I'll eat? He didn't want to be separated from her. All right. Talk about love for a wife, huh? That's what it says. He had such a love for his wife, he felt she'd be taken from him. He didn't realize that God could have replaced her. Was he deceived? Well, According I, to scripture, I, 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 apparently I mean, not. If, if God made Eve out of 
from his body, why didn't why didn't he did he just forget? If you love someone, you're not looking for a replacement. Haven't you loved something in your life that you put ahead of God? And if you say yeah, I say that's never happened, then you know I'm not, you're not telling the truth. <laughs> That's kind of a loaded question, but don't give an answer. But uh, that's the problem we all have, is we love something, and then we talked a few slides back about we put some things aside that we want God to deal with, and we put something else aside that don't bother with this. I'll take care of it. That's the nature of sin, yes. Also, who was head of the human race? Adam. Okay, he was created first. That doesn't make women less. We have a terrible thought today of because women and men do different things and are created differently that are not equal. Well, men don't have babies either, and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> and so God puts genders together Okay, in order to round out what it means to have the image of God, we dare not touch that. Do you agree? We dare not touch. Trust your Bible on how, to, how it just basically tells how men and women, how we are to function as Christians. If we stick with that, we'll be okay. If we get off of it, we're going to have a problem. All right, let's go on. I think probably to finish our lesson, which we've got to do, um, this is just really quickly here. What was God's response to this whole issue? What was his response? The one that was kind of clothed, and I will put what? Enmity between you and the woman. Who is the woman? The church, a beautiful virgin, Bible in Revelation describes as God's church, okay? between you and her offspring. What is the offspring of the church? It is Jesus himself, is it not? Born as a babe from an earthly mother and conceived by the Holy Spirit. He says, he will crush your head. It is Resurrection Sunday tomorrow. On Resurrection Day, when Jesus came out of that tomb and left it empty, Satan's received his death sentence. And that's what it says here. He'll crush your head, but he will crush your, or he will strike your heel. The church has been striking its heel for a long time. And Jesus went through, you know what, in order to accomplish his goal. That was Satan's devising. But at the end, Jesus said, don't worry about this. I'm going to take care of it. And that's why tomorrow, when you think about Resurrection Sunday, we should celebrate with all Christians today, our Baptist friends, our Congregationalist friends, and whoever else who worship Jesus Christ. He's their personal Savior, and they honor the day of resurrection. That's a good thing, don't you think? That's a wonderful thing. We should support them in that, and so forth, because without the resurrection, it doesn't make any difference about anything else. Is that true? Let us pray. Father, we give thanks again for Jesus and his love for us. Why do we need your help and your assistance? We need your love and kindness. We need your constant direction.